today's topic, I'm going to talk about war experiences of two Confederate doctors in the 1860s and a little bit about the rest of their careers. Neither one of, the, neither one of today's doctors that we're going to talk about is Dr. Pepper or his Walmart sponsored cousin, Dr. Thunder. Um, there was no Dr. Thunder in the war that I'm aware of, but Dr. Claude Pepper actually was a Confederate surgeon from Texas who invented soft drink in the 1880s. So there's one trivia point to carry away uh, from today's little session. Um, but the two gentlemen I am going to talk about, um, to repeat a constant refrain of mine, and it also happens to be my response to everything I'm reading about the Grant uh, miniseries that just appeared on the History Channel. Um, history on video, whether it's an expensive uh, documentary with high production values, or whether it's some guy who works for a museum talking to you on Zoom. If the history is on video, please consider that history to be a commercial for good history books. Uh, and there's an awful lot to read out there. And in the course of my uh, research for these two guys today, uh, I did learn that one of them does have a full length biography. I haven't been able to get that book in time uh, for today's session, but I look forward to digging in a little further uh, and there is an awful lot to learn out there. And the best way to do it is going to be through books. Nevertheless, let me hopefully get you interested in uh, a subject that's worth looking into further. And today we're going to look at the careers of these two guys. Benjamin Walter Taylor and Simon Baruch. Now, these men did have some things in common uh, beyond the fact that they were both uh, Confederate Army doctors from South Carolina, uh, and they both had distinguished careers afterwards. Uh, they had also both been students at South Carolina's medical college. Uh, and Dr. Baruch additionally had studied at the Medical College of Virginia in his day. But there the similarities perhaps ended. They, they did come from very different backgrounds indeed, and their war experiences were different as well. So these two South Carolina physicians, uh, both of them interesting, and each of them with uh, a little bit extra that we can learn from uh, their own experiences. And let's start with Simon here. Simon Baruch looks very sharp in his coat. Uh, his sash is green. Remember, this is a black and white photo. It hasn't been colorized, but the, the sash on his Confederate officer's coat here is green which indicated the medical department. And this was certainly an overachieving, bright young man. He had just gotten his medical diploma. He had just become a physician in 1862. And at that time, he was 22 years old. Uh, now back up and think about that for a moment uh, today. Uh, the undergraduate degree of a person who's considered to be more or less on, on educational schedule. They'll, they'll get their bachelor's at age 22. He has become a doctor of medicine at age 22. And he has done this uh, studying in um, perhaps not his second language, but an additional language to those that he grew up with. Uh, which included German because he had emigrated from Prussia where he was born and lived for the first 
uh, part of his life. And this Prussian immigrant was also a Sephardic Jew. So Yiddish uh, and some degree of Hebrew were surely among his accomplishments, uh, as well as Latin being a necessity for medical training uh, in those days. So he acquires that somewhere along the course of his education. Uh, and his family lived in Camden, South Carolina. And there was a, a large, for the time, an active Jewish community in the state of South Carolina, uh, particularly in Charleston, but also in additional locations like Camden. And Simon Baruch is going to join the army as a doctor, as a medical officer, uh, and go off to war with South Carolina's troops. Well, happily for us, turns out that uh, Dr. Baruch, who was much published in the medical field after the war, actually during and after the war, he was published in the medical field. Uh, there was exactly one medical journal being published in the Confederacy. Uh, and he had an article in that journal in 1864. Um, so he managed uh, this among all of the other things that were going on in his life at the time, to also do a study and to publish a study in a medical journal in 1864, uh, a study on bayonet wounds. And I'll return to that shortly. So Simon, uh, happily after the war, as well as publishing medical works, did take the time to write down some of his reminiscences. And so I'm going to read briefly from a couple of those things that he left behind to us. And the first one I'm going to mention connects with our session on Micah Jenkins. Uh, those of you that heard the discussion of Micah Jenkins or perhaps saw the uh, history, uh, the Mysteries at the Museum episode about Micah Jenkins and his sword of prophecy. Uh, you all remember that Jenkins was killed in a tragic friendly fire accident at the wilderness in 1864. And Dr. Simon Baruch wanted to write uh, a tribute to another man who was killed um, in the same folly or, or in the in related circumstances uh, that terrible day and it was a very terrible day uh, for so many people the battle of the wilderness uh, but certainly for south carolinians and like a lot of things that were written in the confederate veterans magazine uh, in the 20th century uh, this little note resulted from a veteran in this case dr baruch Dr. Baruch was reading a book about the war. He saw something that had been written in the book that uh, was, was a little bit inaccurate and his memories didn't jive with it and he had a correction to make. And we can be happy that he read the book and made the correction because it adds to our knowledge. He writes, in General Longstreet's book, From Manassas to Appomattox, page 564, the following is given. And then he gives Longstreet's description of that um, friendly fire volley that was so devastating, the accident that happened at uh, the wilderness. Uh, just then, our party of officers, Generals Longstreet, Jenkins, Kershaw, and staff, came up and rode under fire. Kershaw, of course, is from Camden, just like Dr. Baruch. Uh, General Jenkins fell mortally wounded. Captain Doby and Orderly Bowen of Kershaw's staff were killed. General Kershaw turned to quiet the troops when Jenkins' brigade with leveled guns were in the act of returning the fire of the supposed enemy. So Kershaw stopped his men from returning friendly fire on those who had just fired on them. So that was Longstreet's 
version of what happened, and Longstreet says that an orderly named Bowen from Kershaw's staff has been killed. That is what Dr. Baruch believes he needs to correct. And he writes in, as to what happened behind the scenes, the morning was well advanced, the roar of artillery and the rattle of musketry distinctly heard at the field hospital. I remember the scene distinctly. As I was about to operate on a severely wounded man, Marcus Baum, a handsome fellow of about 25, attached to the stash of staff of Kershaw, who was very fond of him, dashed into the camp on a white horse covered with foam and with anxious voice begged to know where General Kershaw could be found. Do you hear that volley, Marcus? said I. The general's always in the front. Well, that's ironic. Baruch says, follow the sound of the guns. And what he's actually telling the man to do, follow the sound of the volley, he doesn't know that was a volley that has uh, actually killed men right next to General Kershaw. I must go to him at once, cried he. The general sent me off with a message, digging his spurs into the flanks of his horse he disappeared. I was trying to explain the impossibility of reaching Kershaw. Well, he reached Kershaw in time to be shot dead. Two hours later, the body of Major General Wadsworth of the Union Army was brought to our hospital and reverently placed upon the sod to await transportation through the lines. A moment later, the white horse of Marcus Baum came trotting into the camp, his neck sprinkled with the lifeblood of a gallant rider who had galloped him to the front to join his commander. In the confusion of the fight, his body was never recovered. He lies in an unmarked grave on the bloodstained soil of the wilderness. And then Kershaw gets to why he needed to respond. It is but just to chronicle this historic fact and correct the name given by Longstreet as Bowen, which sounds like Bowman, as the name was always pronounced. He was a German and a Hebrew. Though exempt from military duty as a foreigner, he enlisted early. No braver man, no truer to the cause, no soldier more loyal to his chief ever breathed than Marcus Baum of Camden, South Carolina, special aide to General Joseph B. Kershaw, his friend. So one can only imagine these two young men in their 20s in danger, Baum and Baruch, uh, and working together fairly often, uh, must have perhaps shared a special bond, both of faith and ethnicity, uh, and of uh, German language and heritage. And so when Baruch saw that his, uh, his friend's name had been mistaken by General Longstreet, it was something that he needed to correct. You also see there that he takes time to note that at his Confederate field hospital, the body of a dead federal general had been laid out for transportation back through the lines, uh, that they were going to courteously return the senior officer for burial by his own side. And that's a theme you see again and again in Baruch's reminiscences, is um, making an effort to civility among the medical men because the medical men as the medical men, hopefully in, in any conflict, uh, are engaging in relieving the suffering uh, and bringing some kind of healing when they can to everybody who's hurt, uh, to everybody who's suffering from the war. And that includes extending courtesy to the dead. Now, there's a story I really wanted to tell for today's session, and it's one of the reasons I need to get that full-length biography and read it of Dr. Baruch, because right now I can't point to a primary source. I'm looking for primary sources, uh, but I chose this topic just a few days ago, and uh, I, what I thought would be easy to find has been a little more difficult to pin down. But as the story is told, and remember, I'm, I'm telling you this now as a story that is told, not something I've been able to confirm by 
independent research or point to you at that, to a specific footnote on it. Uh, that uh, Simon Baruch was criticized at times by other doctors for taking excessive time uh, doing something the rest of them were not doing. Uh, that in these days before germ theory, doctors were not stopping to wash their hands. Uh, that uh, the theory was, I'm bloody already, my instruments are bloody, there are so many casualties that they need to be treated in a hurry. It would be a terrible waste of time to stop and wash my instruments. But as the story is passed down, Simon Baruch frequently stopped and washed his hands. And this very basic precaution that we think of today um, was not due to a particular medical emphasis yet at that time, but rather that Dr. Baruch was uh, attempting to follow to some degree the laws of purification from the Old Testament uh, after you have contact with the dead. Now, I have not been able to confirm that, but that his identity was important to his, his conduct, that his faith was important to his conduct, seems to be something that pops up again and again. Well, at Gettysburg, Dr. Baruch is treating the wounded as usual, the wounded from both sides as usual. Uh, the battle is lost, and General Lee's army goes into retreat. And on that day, he received a, a difficult order. Uh, Dr. Simon Baruch and a couple of other doctors received orders to stay behind with the wounded, uh, the ones who could not be evacuated. And, of course, this is basically an order that uh, they're ordered to be captured. Uh, and so he left a reminiscence of his experiences there and in the immediate aftermath. Uh, this appears in Confederate Veteran Magazine by Simon Baruch as a surgeon's story of battle and capture. On the 1st of July, 1863, a forced march brought McClaw's division from the neighborhood of Chambersburg to a meadow in which we camped on the dew-covered grass. The stars were still twinkling when at dawn the column was again formed and the weary troops wended their way to what proved to be the most sanguinary battlefield of the war. Skipping a bit, Kershaw's brigade, to which my command belonged, was deployed opposite the peach orchard, preparing to charge a battery of artillery, the shells from which I saw and felt in uncanny proximity when I received orders to proceed to the field hospital, the Black Horse Tavern on the Hagerstown Road. We had scarcely opened our battlefield supplies and hurriedly set up operating tables constructed of doors laid upon dry good boxes and barrels. When the ambulances began to bring their sad loads, the result of the charge on the battery in the Peach Orchard, Wounded men related how the battery had been captured and a Wisconsin brigade supporting it put to flight when in order to close a gap on the right of the line deflected the charging column and enabled the retreating artillerymen to return and send a destructive enfilading fire of grape into their flank. Nearly all the wounds were on the left side. Uh, and this is uh, apparently Baruch was a very precise and observant man. And he correlated what he heard about the battle battery. Oh, we were taking enfilading fire uh, and the position of the artillery from which we were taking enfilading fire. I logically resulted in nearly all the wounds being on the left side. All day and all night, the work continued at the field hospital. Throughout the following day also, the wounded came pouring in, many on foot. Among them, several captured Union soldiers, on two of whom I operated, defending them like our own. At sundown, I threw myself on the hay and slept until aroused by an orderly who brought a command from General Lee for doctors Pierce, Knott, and Baruch to remain at the Black Horse Tavern Field Hospital, quote, until further orders, unquote. 
since the army was in full retreat, we realized this order meant capture by the enemy. Well, this is not the first time this has happened to Dr. Baruch. Uh, he had actually been um, overrun before, left behind with a field hospital that was captured by the enemy. Uh, and on that occasion, having had six weeks of the most agreeable period of army life, so he thought his first six weeks of Union captivity as a doctor uh, were actually a break. I regarded this order into cap captivity with much more complacency than my colleagues. The morning found us amid Nobel surroundings. The slightly wounded had been removed, most of them being able to march. The field hospital contained now 222 seriously wounded men, 10 orderlies and three surgeons. The demands of hunger claimed paramount attention, for we had not eaten a meal in three days. Those three days of Battle of Ginsburg. A peacock strutting on the meadow was slain and roasted for our breakfast. Within the tavern, which had been hastily abandoned on the approach of the army, cold biscuits, some coffee and sugar, dishes, etc., were found. A table was constructed in the orchard. The surgeons seated ourselves to enjoy a feast which the hospital cook had placed steaming on the table. Here was peace at last. Above our heads, the July sun shone brightly. Birds were twittering in the trees. Fragrant blossoms scented the still air. The calm seemed uncanny. Never shall I forget the satisfaction with which I raised a knife to carve this novel roast fowl, the peacock. Saying, here goes, my companions laughed in joyous response. The knife had not touched the fowl when suddenly the scene of content and promised joy was overcast by the clouds of war. A shell flew shrieking over our heads, its shrill whistling whistle silenced by an explosion in the field nearby. So the battle's not quite over yet. Uh, they have to dash away to cover. They get back to cold food later, and then the Federals appear. As far as the eye could see, the summit of the hill was covered by a line of cavalry whose weapons shimmered in the brilliant July sun. The suddenness of their appearance lent awe to the scene. Slowly the line rode down the hill. Dr. Pierce, the ranking officer, directed me to meet the pickets and to surrender because, he said, you understand these Yankees. I hastily donned my gray coat and green sash and sauntered toward the advancing line Calverman being about three feet apart. A burly fellow ominously raised his pistol when I said, I surrender. Where's your commanding officer? In a distinctly Irish brogue, he cried aloud, Say, Cap, here's a Reb wants to see you. The captain galloped to my side, saluted, and asked, Are there many rebels around? I said, Yes, but they're all wounded. He replied, We'll see to that ourselves. Fall in, men. We were surrounded, sounded, and the cavalcade dashed away. Well, he continues working at the field hospital. He's technically a prisoner, but he's still a functioning doctor at this point. Six weeks were spent at the field hospital, weeks replete with interesting ethical and surgical experiences. On the morning of the second day of our captivity, I was called to the flap door of my tent and was surprised to be greeted by an officer in a chaplain's uniform. His face beamed with kindness as he said, I am Dr. Winslow of the Christian Commission. I've come to offer you any assistance in our power and to furnish you some supplies. These are meager because General Stewart has cut our communication, but we will gladly share them with you. Tears started to my eyes and a lump rose in my throat as I realized for the first time in my life a practical demonstration of the precept, love thine enemy. So this is something that makes a deep impression on Baruch. Uh, he has both positive and negative experiences with his captors. Uh, after the field hospital is closed, they are actually sent to a prison camp uh, and he's not sure what's going to happen to him as a doctor. When the wounded had been disposed of, we were ordered to report to the provost marshal. This individual was of a type which I had not before encountered. 
He was an impudent, pompous chap, probably under the influence of liquor. My statement that I was ready to be sent home, he responded with a sneer, I guess you are. Just come here tonight at seven. I have a lot of other rebels. You may go along with them. We were marched under guard, my first experience of that. Uh, and what happens here, I'm sorry, a sergeant whose patriotism doubtless was of finer quality than his grammar yelled, all you men what is surgeons in the rebel army fall in here. The segregation from the other prisoners confirmed my expectation of immediate transfer to our lines. He thinks he's being sent back, thinks he's a doctor. I was sadly in error. We were marched under guard to Barnum's Hotel on Monument Square in Lock. At noon, a dirty man appeared with a basket containing chunks of bacon and bread. Taking a piece of bread in one hand, he placed a piece of bacon upon it by pushing it off a fork with his thumb, saying, here's your ration. Well, um, as, a, as a doctor and a man of cleanliness, uh, this does not please Dr. Baruch. And remember as well, um, he can't even eat the, the bread now without breaking the kosher laws because the bacon has been pushed onto it. He doesn't actually say whether he ate that meal or not. Having been coddled so long and enjoyed the best food, this experience was rather startling to the hundred or more surgeons and 15 chaplains ascended, assembled at the hotel, which at that time was used as a political prison. However, hunger is the best to koch, as the Germans say. Um, hunger is the best cook. So maybe that bacon went down. Our appetites have been well sharpened by the absence of breakfast. So were our wits. We held a meeting, the usual thing among Americans, passed resolutions protesting against this cruel treatment of non-combatants, sent them to the officer in charge. Well, they're going to be held at Fort McHenry for a while. Aside from the food, our stay at Fort McHenry would have been like a summer spent at a seaside resort. There were 110 surgeons and 10 chaplains. Uh, and one of the surgeons had been bribed by our outside friends. Those are the Confederate sympathizers of Baltimore. Whenever this particular sergeant was on guard duty at the gate, we had the password. Frequently, one or more prisoners passed through the gate at night and returned before morning after having enjoyed friendly entertainment in Baltimore. Uh, so they're sneaking out at, uh, of the prison camp with the aid of the cooperative bribed sergeant. Uh, and this leads to a, a problem eventually. One day, an officer was brought from headquarters that the chaplains prepare themselves for removal. So just the chaplains are going to be sent home. The doctors are still being held. Here was a dilemma. Three of the 10 chaplains had not returned from their Baltimore visit. Indeed, they had gone to Canada, as was learned thereafter. And there, with utter disregard of their cloth, had participated in an unsuccessful attempt to liberate the Confederate officers imprisoned on Edwards Island near Buffalo. So they want the 10 chaplains to go home, but three of the chaplains have already escaped. So the doctors got together and decided that they're going to pick three of the doctors to impersonate the chaplains and be released in their place. Our uniforms had ceased to indicate our rank, and some of us wore civilian coats. One of the doctors chosen was a fiery little Texan who habitually garnished every sentence with the choicest profanity. And he was selected with fear and trembling. When the provost marshal called the roll, the chaplains in due form were all accounted for. He checked them off and ordered them to fall in. Accompanied by the entire contingent, the chaplains marched down to the bait boat and went on board. 
not without a private guard of colleagues over the little Texas doctor. The danger was past. The sergeant, alarmed by the narrow escape, deprived us of the privilege of visiting Baltimore anymore. So, an irresistible story from the time of the doctor's captivity. After he was released, he wrote that article for the Confederate Medical Journal that was published. Uh, and that article specifically uh, undertook a, a study of two men from the third South Carolina who had been wounded with bayonets in the fighting for Spotsylvania Courthouse. Uh, and so he published a um, journal article. And the, um, the myth persists to this day. You'll, you'll hear it from reenactors, you'll hear it from soldiers, you'll hear it from all sorts of folks, that the triangular bayonet that was used at that time uh, was a particularly lethal weapon whose wounds could not be cured. Uh, and the bayonet was not made triangular in order to inflict a particular wound. It was cheaper to make it strong that way. And also they wanted to encourage the soldiers to use the point and not slash. So they gave them no slashing edge, just point. However, in Dr. Baruch's experience and opinion, soldiers dreaded the bayonet wound too much. They weren't as serious, he thought, as um, myth held them. And in his article, he wrote, the dread of cold steel is, in my humble opinion, attributable to ignorance. The bayonet is almost harmless when compared to the plowed tracks, which the terrible mini ball tears through the tissues. Uh, and he reports that these bayonet wounds were successfully treated and left no mark and that if you were more scared of a bayonet than a mini ball, you had your priorities well out of order. I'm sorry, Dr. Benjamin Walter Taylor, almost universally known, however, by his colleagues and his fellow soldiers by his nickname, Watt. Well, Watt Taylor came from a um, very high class South Carolina background. Uh, the Taylor family had been very significant in South Carolina. Uh, and very prominent in South Carolina. And he had attended as well South Carolina Medical College and become a doctor. He had actually been born in Columbia uh, and the descendant of Colonel Thomas Taylor. He graduated South Carolina College in 1855 South Carolina Medical College in 1858 and had been in practice for two years uh, before he went in as an assistant surgeon. And he is going to spend most of his military career accompanying the cavalry. So Benjamin Taylor is often going to be in the company of Wade Hampton, of Benjamin Butler, uh, and of the names who are so well known as uh, South Carolina's cavalry soldiers. I have a few anecdotes of his service as well to pass along. He was apparently a man with pretty, um, a pretty reassuring manner about him. And a story here from the Gettysburg campaign, since we talked about Baruch at Gettysburg. Uh, a soldier writes in his reminiscences long after the war, it was there that I received my closest call. A mini ball entered my left breast going down over and out under the fifth rib. And we think of Dr. Baruch's uh, comment about the terrible track plowed by the mini ball. Um, entered my left breast going down over and out under the fifth rib. Uh, what the term for this is uh, in modern military medicine, one of the first things that you were taught and that is emphasized to you 
is how to deal with the dreaded sucking chest wound. The gallant Lieutenant Baxter, the bravest of all the brave, walked up to me where I stood, the blood spurting at every breath, looked me straight in the face and said, I think you were about gone up, old fellow. I thought then, and I haven't changed my mind since, that that was the poorest consolation I ever had offered me in my life. The ball that passed through me made 13 holes in my blanket. Apparently he was wearing his blanket roll. Dr. Taylor, assistant surgeon, came up and I asked him what he thought of my chance. He examined me, rather hurriedly, and said, I don't see why you should not get well. I said, Doctor, I'll take your advice. Then I walked out to the field hospital and from there watched the progress of the great battle. Certain stoicism there and one theme in some of uh, the reminiscences about Dr. Taylor is the, um, uh, the sort of stoical sense that was cultivated. Uh, that soldier certainly shows it. And in, on one of the occasions uh, when General Wade Hampton was wounded in the foot, he rode his horse over to the medical tent uh, Taylor came out to help him, and as the, as the anecdote goes, uh, Taylor called a hospital steward to help him off of his horse, and Hampton said, no, I'm not getting off my horse. Uh, you do whatever you can for my foot right where it is, uh, and then I'm riding back. So that stoicism is something uh, that was seen on both sides and comes through some of the stories of Taylor's service from Butler and his cavalry in the War of Secession, a veteran writes, that much beloved surgeon, Dr. B.W. Taylor, hearing of Sparks' terrible wound, took an ambulance into the enemy's lines and brought him safely out into Culpeper County, where he soon recovered. Dr. Taylor gave no thought to danger. Where the wounded were, there he was. And that is a strong soldier's tribute to a uh, combat physician. Um, the exact circumstances there, this is by one of the men known as Wade Hampton's Iron Scouts who operated behind the lines. So the wounded man was actually in enemy territory and it was a bit of a covert mission for the Confederate physician uh, to take a wagon and a horse to move into enemy territory where these scouts have been operating to find the wounded scout and to bring him successfully back. Taylor was present at um, some of the tragic events. Of course, as a physician, he was present constantly at tragic events for people and families involved in the war, but some of those that are best known to in South Carolina story he was involved with. And another reminiscence of him says, um, on the day when Wade Hampton's son, Preston, was killed, and Wade's son, Wade the Fourth, as well, had been um, badly wounded. Uh, it was Dr. Taylor who treated the boy. Our own Dr. B.W. Taylor took no heed of cannonballs nor mini balls that day, but spent the whole time alleviating the suffering of the wounded. Never was there a surgeon in any army who behaved with more gallantry and Christian fortitude than did Dr. Taylor. The tribute paid to Dr. Taylor by uh, his old commander, um, not Wade Hampton, who had already passed away, uh, but Matthew Colbraith Butler, the Brigadier General that Taylor would answer to in the cavalry um, after Hampton was further promoted. This is what uh, was written by M.C. Butler in response to the news of Taylor's death in 1905. Dr. Taylor, familiarly known by his friends as Watt, Taylor was my college mate at the South Carolina College way back in the 50s. We entered the Confederate service together. 
He was chief surgeon of my regiment. He performed the surgical operation on the 9th of June, 1863, which I verily believe saved my life. He was surgeon of the 1st Cavalry Brigade, Army of Northern Virginia, band of the 1st Division, commanded respectively by General Hampton and myself. Added to that, he was my comrade and friend. A man more devoted to his duty, whether to friend or enemy, a more conspicuously courageous soldier and gentleman never lived. He was moreover up amongst the first in his profession of surgery and medicine. He never complained or found fault, but went straight ahead doing his duty. He never said unkind, ill-natured things about anybody, although a man of strong convictions and undoubted courage. Of all the men I've known in a long, checkered career, there were three, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Hampton, Dr. B.W. Taylor, and Major Jack Preston, whom I've always cherished with the sincerest affection. They were such thorough gentlemen, so true, so courageous, so gracious, so free, from guile and deceit. May the blessing of God be with him and remain with him is my devout and heartfelt prayer. I know he will be among the elect in the next world. So Dr. Benjamin Walter Taylor, an officer so trusted that for a brief period in 1865, when a cavalry regiment was without a commander, Somebody said, well, on paper, the doctor holds the rank to hold that command, and he actually held command of a regiment for a couple of weeks. Um, not during active fighting, but it's one more unusual distinction for this man. Well, Dr. Taylor would return home to Columbia, South Carolina, where he was a beloved local physician, as well as um, a deacon at his church, Trinity Episcopal, in Columbia. And both of these men really had interesting post-war careers. Uh, they were both involved in one way or another with uh, what was then called the South Carolina Lunatic Asylum. Uh, and while Dr. Taylor concentrated on practice, Dr. Simon Baruch uh, did more that had to do, uh, and this, that's Baruch as an older man on the left, uh, did things that had more to do with theory and also with public health. Uh, his study on bayonet wounds was widely read in militaries all around the world. And after uh, the end of Reconstruction, Dr. Baruch had offices in uh, the state's medical structure. By 1880, uh, Dr. Baruch was the chairman of the South Carolina Board of Health. And in that year of 1880, one of the uh, research projects he had ongoing at the time was the study of malaria. Uh, they hadn't confirmed what transmitted malaria yet, but he was taking major strides uh, toward uh, effective mitigation of the disease. And in 1880, it was Dr. Simon Baruch who turned in uh, a report to the legislature on vaccination. And this report in 1880 resulted in the first official legislative action on vaccination in the state of South Carolina. Unfortunately, that is all I know about uh, the the action. I don't know what that action was, uh, but it's interesting that he was involved. Uh, he would become a pioneer in appendectomies. That was an operation he specialized in. And also an advocate of the idea that the most important thing a physician does is not uh, treatments, but the maintenance of health. Uh, and he said physicians should be aware and should recommend and prescribe good habits and food, cleanliness, exercise, rest, and water, both internal and external. By internal, he meant good hydration. By external, he meant various forms of what was called hydrotherapy. And his hydrotherapy studies uh, had a big effect on the profession 
and ironically went full circle. They were translated from English to German and published back in his country of origin in Stuttgart. Uh, Dr. Baruch was also an advocate of making everything less stinky. That is, uh, at least humanity. Uh, you see, Dr. Baruch was pushing the idea, remember, he was a big believer in cleanliness during the war, which some attributed to the laws of his faith. Well, he was a big believer in cleanliness for the public as well. And without the kind of modern uh, plumbing facilities that we all take for granted, it was a lot harder for folks to bathe. Uh, he is the one who started the public bathhouse movement figuring that if ancient Rome could keep clean with public baths, that public baths were a great idea for places like New York City. Oh yes, by this time, uh, Dr. Simon Baruch had ended up in New York City. Uh, he was very well established in South Carolina. Uh, he had, of course, his connections, his record, his family, but it seems that in Camden, uh, he had a very strong negative reaction, a great discouragement about the society around him when in 1880, former Colonels Cash and Shannon of the Confederate Army fought their duel in Camden. Uh, the, the failure of society to prevent that duel, in, in some way this was a personal trauma to him and sort of a straw that broke the camel's back, he decided um, to leave Camden society uh, and start anew in New York City, where he became a very prominent physician and public health figure, and where he today has a middle school named after him. And this is the grave at Elmwood Cemetery of Dr. Benjamin Watt Taylor, uh, and that's a local pilgrimage you can make. Another pilgrimage you can make involving Watt Taylor is to the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum in Columbia, where we have Dr. Taylor's sword that he carried uh, as a, a symbol of his rank. During the war, we have his medical chest. Uh, we have a couple of things from him from his attendance at uh, South Carolina's Medical College. Uh, and you know, we're proud to hold in trust his artifacts so that his story can be passed along. So thank you all very much for listening to me today. I appreciate you dropping in for another history talk uh, about two really interesting men who did everything they could to alleviate suffering during the war uh, and who both had prestigious uh, and effective medical careers